Hello brothers and sisters. So if you've been watching from the beginning, this is video number five. We're halfway through. There's eight videos. I hope these have been encouraging to you. Again, as I read this book with my family, I was so excited, encouraged by it. Uh, they agreed. I decided to put these videos together to try and encourage y'all as well in terms of your reading of the Bible. Um, again, we are uh, seeking to develop uh, these habits and I gave you at the beginning video uh, the reading amount per minute and I'm going to just briefly review that again. Um, read the book of Isaiah chapter 10 or Hebrews chapter 11 and time yourself and depending on um, how many minutes it takes you, you will find that you read anywhere from um, five minutes a day, Monday through Friday, 10 minutes a day, Monday through Friday, 15 minutes a day, Monday through Friday, or at most 20 minutes a day, Monday through Friday, and you will get through the whole Bible in one year. Uh, this is reading for familiarity, uh, like we would read any other book for pleasure. Just sit down and read it through, and where you stop, put your little marker. I like to use those uh, little tabs. I don't see any here right now, so I won't pull them out. Um, but the little um, markers that um, are, here's one, yeah, uh, these little things. I don't know if you can see that or not. Let me put it up a little closer, down on my shirt, easier to say. And uh, it's just sticking on one side, uh, and you can pull them off, put them back on as you move forward. So uh, with those things in mind, uh, let me... Uh, turn now to Ryle's advice on reading the Bible. This is his sixth point where he challenges us about the wonders of what Bible reading does for us. Let's read together. Six, in the sixth place, the Bible is the only rule by which all questions of doctrine or of duty can be tried. The Lord God knows the weakness and infirmity of our poor fallen understandings. He knows that even after conversion, our perceptions of right and wrong are exceedingly indistinct. He knows how artfully Satan can gild error with an appearance of truth and can dress up wrong with plausible arguments until it looks right. Knowing all this, he has mercifully provided us with an unerring standard of truth and error, right and wrong, and has taken care to make that standard a written book, even the scripture. No one can look around the world and not see the wisdom of such a provision. No one can live long and not find out that he is constantly in need of a counselor and advisor, of a rule of faith and practice on which he can depend. Unless he lives like a beast without a soul and conscience, he will find himself constantly assailed by difficult and puzzling questions. He will often be asking himself, What must I believe? What must I do? Here are a number of observations from Ryle. The world is full of difficulties about points of doctrine. The house of error lies close alongside the house of truth. The door of one is so like the door of the other that there is a continual risk of mistakes. Does a man read or travel much? He will soon find the most opposite opinions prevailing among those who are called Christians. He will discover that different people give the most different answers to the most important question. What shall I do to be saved? The Roman Catholic and the Protestant and the Neologian and the Tractarian, the Mormite and the Swedborgian, each and all will assert that he alone has the truth. Each and all will tell him that he is safety, that safety is not only to be found in his party, is only to be found in his party. Each and all say, come with us. All this is puzzling. What shall a man do? Does he settle down quietly in some English or Scottish parish? He will soon find that even in our own land the most conflicting views are held. He will soon discover that there are serious differences among Christians as to the comparative importance of the various parts and articles of the faith. One man thinks of nothing but church government, another man of nothing but sacraments, services, and forms, a third of nothing but preaching the gospel. Does the, he apply to ministers for a solution? He will perhaps find one minister teaching one doctrine and another another. <laughs> All this is puzzling. What shall a man do? There is one an only one answer to this question. A man must make the Bible alone his rule. He must receive nothing and believe nothing which is not according to the word. He must try all religious teaching by one simple test. Does it square with the Bible? What says the scripture? 
I wish that the eyes of the laity of this country were more open on this subject. I wish that they would learn to weigh sermons, books, opinions, and ministers in the scales of the Bible, and to value all things according to the conformity to the world. I wish that they, excuse me, their conformity to the word, I wish that they would see that it matters little who says a thing, whether he be father or reformer, bishop or archbishop, priest or deacon, archdeacon or dean. The only question is, is the thing said of Scripture? If it is, it ought to be received and believed. If it is not, it ought to be refused and cast aside. I fear the consequences of that servile acceptance of everything which, quote, the pastor says, which is so common among English laymen. I fear lest they be led, um, they know not where, like the blind Syrians, and awake some day to find themselves in the power of Roman Catholicism, 2 Corinthians 6.20. Oh, that men in England would only remember for what purpose the Bible was given them. Some say that it is presumptuous to judge a minister's teachings by the word. When one doctrine is proclaimed in one parish and another in another, people must read and judge for themselves. Both doctrines cannot be right, and both ought to be tried by the word. I charge them above all things never to suppose that any true minister of the gospel will dislike his people measuring all that he teaches by the Bible. On the contrary, the more they read the Bible and prove all he says by the Bible, the better he will be pleased. Amen. A false minister may say, You have no right to use your private judgment. Leave the Bible to us who are ordained. A true minister will say, Search the scriptures, and if I did not teach you what is scriptural, do not believe me. A false minister may cry, Hear the church and hear me. A true minister will say, Hear the word. Second point, the Bible is not only full of difficulties about points of doctrine, it is equally full of difficulties about points of practice. Every professing Christian who wishes to act conscientiously must know that it is so. The most puzzling questions are continually arising. He is tried on every side by doubts as to the line of duty and can often hardly see what is the right thing to do. He is tried by questions connected with the management of his worldly calling, if it is in business or in trade. He sometimes sees things going on of a very doubtful character, things that can hardly be called fair, straightforward, and truthful. But then everybody in the trade does these things. They have always been done in the most respectable businesses. There would be no carrying on a profitable business if they were not done. These are not things that are distinctly named and prohibited by God. All this is very puzzling. What is a man to do? He is tried by questions about worldly amusements, races and balls and operas and theaters and parties and all very doubtful methods of spending time. But then he sees numbers of great people taking part in them. Are all these people wrong? Can there really be such mighty harm in these things? All this is very puzzling. What is a man to do? He is tried by questions about the education of his children. He wishes to train them up morally and religiously and to remember their souls. But he is told by many sensible people that young people will be young, that it does not do to check and restrain them too much, and that he ought to attend children's parties and give children's balls himself. He is informed that this nobleman or that lady of rank always does so. We would say this celebrity or that celebrity. And yet they are reckoned religious people. Surely it cannot be wrong. All this is very puzzling. What is he to do? There is only one answer to all these questions. A man must make the Bible alone his rule of conduct. He must make its leading principles the compass by which he steers his course through life. By the letter or the spirit of the Bible, he must test every difficult point and question. Quote, to the law and the testimony, what do the scriptures say? He ought to care nothing for what other people may think right. He ought not to set his watch by the clock of his neighbor, but by the sundial of the word. I charge my readers I solemnly act, to act on the maxim I have just laid down and to adhere to it rigidly all the days of their lives. You will never repent of it. Make it a leading principle never to act contrary to the word. Do not regard the charge of over strictness and needless precision. Remember that you serve a strict and holy God. Do not listen to the common objection that the rule you have laid down is impossible and cannot be observed in such a world as this. <coughs> Let those who make such an objection speak out plainly and tell us for what purposes the Bible is given to man. Let them remember that by the Bible we shall all be judged at the last day, 
and let them learn to judge themselves by it here, lest they be judged and condemned by it hereafter. This mighty rule of faith and practice is the book about which I am addressing you, the readers of this paper, this day. Surely it is no light matter what you are doing with the Bible. Surely when danger is abroad on the right hand and on the left, you, consider, you should consider what you are doing with the safeguard which God has provided. I charge you, I beseech you, to give an honest answer to my question. What are you doing with the Bible? Do you read it? How do you read it? Now those are Ryle's thoughts and the sixth point we're going into the seventh one here in a on the next video and remember please pray and ask god to convict you of the value and the purpose of reading your bible on january 2nd 15 minutes a day if you have to break it up that's okay but i encourage you to try and do it all at one time either in the morning or at lunchtime or in the evening don't fall asleep while you're doing it all right that won't be very very helpful but do just read and relax 15 minutes a day, Monday through Friday, and most of us will be able to get that book done in under a year. Thanks. We'll hit you up next time on the next video. Bye.